Good morning. Good morning. And a very warm welcome to St Luke's Queen Street and to the Ferry Kirk. In case you don't know who I am, um, my name is Robert Graham. I am the lead minister at what we call CAM, which is Camperdown and Lockie Ministry in the western half of Dundee. Um, and I'm also uh, currently your interim moderator for the next wee while. So I'm wearing a number of hats, <laughs> um, and increasingly more hats as, as time goes on. Uh, so that's who I am, and no doubt I'll get to some of you as time goes on. I understand that um, you've been doing a series on journeys, and we're going to carry that on today as we look at Esau and Jacob. So we begin with our call to worship. O oh God, how great your love, which reaches out to greet us. Forgiveness is your way, which in Christ now leads us. Let us worship God as we sing the hymn 268, O oh God of Bethel, by whose hand thy people still are fed. Shall be divided. 
One shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Let us pray. Almighty God, ancient and everlasting, you existed before the creation of the universe, and you are one, indivisible, united in the trinity of love. But that is not our experience in real life. We encounter struggles in families and nations divided. We see people trample others underfoot for the sake of ambition and success. We come across scammers and cheats who would delude and deceive. In short, Jacob is still out to pull a fast one on Esau. So forgive us, Lord. Forgive us when our actions, our words, and our thoughts do not match the high standards of your kingdom of grace and love, and when our Christian integrity is ambiguous. And in the struggles of our stories, the times when we are fearful of retribution or seek to manipulate others and find favour in their eyes or yours. Hold before us the model of Jesus, who through grace and welcome showed a love greater than any side and bigger than us all. And in Jesus' words, we are bold to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. myself up. Lots of things have changed because of this dreadful virus that we call COVID. One of them is, of course, that you're wearing masks. And the other one is that we have to keep on washing our hands. Thank you. And what else do we do? We use the sad, thank you. But there's another thing. When we now meet someone for the first time, or if we're meeting an old friend, what do we have to do with our hand? Or elbow. That's it. Not from the elbows. That's us. The other way of doing it, of course, is we can put our hands together and we say, you know what we say? Namaste, which is Hindi for peace. Or we can say Shalom, which is Hebrew for peace. Or we can say Salam, which is Arabic for peace. So these are these are a number of ways that you can greet your friends. You can say Namaste, Shalom, or Salam. But of course, the way that we've always done it up to COVID was to shake hands. And do you know why people shake hands? There's a reason for it. Going way, way back. Nope. You any idea? If you've got an open hand, you can't... What can you not do? You can't punch, yes, but you can't hide a weapon. And that's why, going back, people shook hands. Way, way back. Right back to the Old Testament. Because if they had an open hand, yeah. 
Well, some people, yes, in the old days, some people would shake with both hands, and that's certainly a mark of sincerity, because that means that neither hand is ever needed. So you're showing that you're absolutely open, that there's no weapon involved. Now, I'll tell you another thing, which is a little bit like it. You know how in the army they salute? Do you know why they salute? No? Nope. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Well, it's all to do with history. It's when the knights, remember the knights, remember they had their hats and their visors? Well, whenever they put their visor up, their hand would end up there. And it meant that the other knight could see their face. Because if their visor was down, he didn't know who it was. But when their visor went up, he could see the face, and he knew if it was a friend or a foe. So all of these things really come from past, from history. So today we are thinking about Esau and Jacob, two brothers. And what we find, in fact, is that while Esau was willing to offer an open hand to his brother Jacob, Jacob wasn't so keen. He had a closed hand and he was retreating. And we're going to explore why that was the case later on in the service. But I want you to think today about how things have changed through history. And it's another change with COVID. Now, I don't know, we might never go back to shaking hands. We might always be bumping elbows or saying namaste. Who knows? But you see how things happen because of events, because of history. It's not because people think, oh, it's a good idea to do that. There's a reason why we take certain actions. So we're going to sing a hymn now that's about forgiveness, which is number 541, Lord I pray, if today. Our Old Testament lesson is to be found in Genesis chapter 33, verses 1 to 12. This is the account of Esau and Jacob meeting at the stream of Jabok, and this in fact would be their last encounter. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, 
Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you? he asked. Jacob answered, They are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, What's the meaning of all these flocks and herds I met? To find favour in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob, if I have found favour in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favourably. Please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I am all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Then Esau said, Let us be on our way. I'll accompany you. Amen. Thank you, Ken. When I was putting together this morning's service order, um, it was quite difficult to find a hymn uh, that was about both Jacob and Esau. But there is a, a lady called Caroline Gillette um, who has written some new hymns to old tunes. And I'm delighted to say that she's written one about Esau and Jacob. So we're going to sing it now. It's called Old Isaac Asked His Nearby Son. And it's to the tune for Wally Wally.
Our second lesson is to be found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, and is about forgiving your brother. against me up to seven times Jesus answered I tell you not seven times but 77 times therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants as he began the settlement a man who owed 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him since he was not able to pay the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be kind with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called his servant in, You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailer to be tortured until he should give up all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart.
Esau said to Jacob, let us be on our way, I'll accompany you. I confess I was quite shocked the other day to learn that the Australian soap Neighbours was being dropped by Channel 5. Now lest anyone here think that I'm a fan of Neighbours, let me immediately clarify by saying that the reason for my shock was that I thought Neighbours had been axed years ago. I didn't realise it was still being aired. I wonder if you are a TV soap fan. Do you never miss Cory? Do you set your clock by East Enders? Or is your taste for Emmerdale and Home and Away? Today we encounter a biblical soap opera, an episode of high drama that we might entitle The Brothers. In the right corner we have Esau the wild, hairy hunter. His domain was that of the mountains and the woodlands. He was a man of fleshy appetites, an earthy character who lacked the final sensibilities of life. He was a plain speaking man who called a spade a shovel, and he would have caused outrage in the gentle gentle par parlours of society. By contrast, in the blue corner we have Jacob, the deceiver, the trickster, a man who dwelt on the plains. Jacob was a con man, a man of forked tongue, not the kind of person you would buy a used car from. He was a crafty and self-seeking individual who could talk a good game and wangle his way into polite society. And there was, shall we say, history between these two brothers. Jacob had stolen Esau's birthright as the eldest son. For what the Bible calls a mess of pottage which is literally a bowl of lentil soup. Esau's carnal hunger had been such that he was led to abandon his spiritual enrichment to satisfy his physical need for food. Later on, this trickery of Jacob was intensified when Jacob, aided by his wily mother Rebekah, disguised himself in animal skins and passed himself off to his father Isaac, who was blind by the stage, as Esau, in order to gain his father's blessing. Many years had passed since those incidents, and finally destiny conspired to have the brothers meet again for one last time. What would happen? Would Esau wreak his revenge? Would Jacob get one over on his older brother yet again? Or would reconciliation be achieved? You can almost hear the soap opera theme music playing in the background, can't you? So how does Jacob react in the face of this reunion? Firstly, Jacob is fearful. That's a first primal emotion, fear. And when he realises that Esau is coming towards him with 400 men in tow, the size of a small army in Old Testament times, Jacob is panic stricken. He is convinced that Esau means him harm, even perhaps to kill him. So Jacob adopts a defensive strategy. He fails to realise, actually, that given the past history between the two brothers, Esau's actually more afraid of Jacob than Jacob is of Esau. So Jacob puts the slave girls with their children in the front, and then Leah and her children in the middle, and finally 
his beloved wife Rachel and his favorite son Joseph in the rear, the back, the same place to be. Now it's very obvious from this positioning who are the special ones in Jacob's family, namely Rachel and Joseph. When faced with an apparent threat, as Jacob was, it is perhaps natural to feel trepidation. And I wonder whether some of you are, deep down, if you're honest with yourself, maybe a little bit fearful about coming together in union. Are you anxious about what traditions might be lost? Are you worried, perhaps, that your sense of Christian fellowship will be somehow watered down? Perhaps you're also acting in a way as Jacob did in the face of the perceived threat of Esau. Do you see a union as a takeover or as a marriage? So that's the first reaction, one of fear. The second reaction of Jacob is that he tries to win favour. His next stratagem is to try and neutralise Esau by flattery and bribery. So he bows low before Esau, seven times in fact, a sign of deference, of respect to his elder brother. He calls himself Esau's servant. He describes Esau as my lord. He even describes seeing Esau in terms of viewing the face of God. Talk about flattery. Such obeisance is described in the Amarna letters from the 18th century BC as a mark of formalizing a treaty between two enemies. In other words, Jacob is wanting to enter into a very formal relationship with him and his brother. A legal agreement, if you like, in which there are clear parameters, but no trust. There is always a danger in going into a union that you view it simply as a legal document on paper, clear parameters, but no trust. And then Jacob goes even further. He offers Esau the gifts of flocks and herds. And Esau declines. He says, look, I've got all, enough already. I don't need any more. But Jacob persists in his offer. And the reason he does that is because he's trying to win back Esau's favor. He's actually offering back to Esau a token of the blessing that he'd stolen from him. There is something decidedly Uriah Heap about Jacob. If you remember, Uriah Heap appears in Dickens novel David Copperfield as an obsequious and insincerely humble individual, a sycophant. Well, Jacob's coming very close, I think, to being in that category. As you go into your union, you have to go in as equal partners, full of confidence that each congregation brings something of value to the table. So you shouldn't go in being unnecessarily humble, you shouldn't go in with flattery, and you certainly shouldn't resort to gifts of bribery. No one part of the union should try and overwhelm the other part. Because all parts are equal brothers and sisters in Christ. Jacob's fear, Jacob seeking favour. But let's go back to the red corner. What about Esau? What does he do? Well, actually, by contrast, Esau emerges from this encounter as a man of integrity and honesty. Esau desires a genuine reconciliation with his brother. He is willing to offer real forgiveness. So he runs towards Jacob, so eager is he to greet him. He embraces Jacob, he kisses Jacob, he, as the Bible puts it, 
falls upon his neck. And that was an ancient sign of offering that open hand that I spoke to the children about. An open hand and an open heart by falling on someone's neck. Esau shows absolutely no evidence at all of having a vengeful spirit and harboring a record of wrongs. And then in that key moment, Esau says to Jacob, let us be on our way. I will accompany you. I will accompany you. Esau wants Jacob to come with him to his home in Seir. He is offering to journey with Jacob. And that, in a sense, is what your union is all about. It's an opportunity to journey together along the way of Christ. This moment between the two brothers is a wonderful moment. All rivalries forgotten, peace has broken out. A moment rich in potential. But, I told you it was a soap opera. But, for Jacob, the old suspicions remain. And Jacob finds a way to wiggle out of Esau's generous heartfelt offer. He claims that he has to go at a slower pace than Esau because of the young that he is with him, both human and animal. He doesn't trust Esau, if we're honest. And without trust, there can be no reconciliation. And as it turns out, Jacob, in fact, goes off in a different direction entirely, and he heads towards Sukkot. Are you ready to travel together as brothers and sisters? Or do all suspicions remain? Is there still mistrust that contaminates the relationship? I'm reminded of the story of the two sisters who'd fallen out years before over some trifling incident. In fact, it was so long ago, neither of them could recall the source of the quarrel. But they hadn't spoken to each other for years and years and years. One Christmas, their nephew, the son of their deceased third sister, persuaded his two aunts to bury past differences and to phone each other on Christmas Day. Both of them agreed. And the nephew went off home full of hope that reconciliation would be achieved. Boxing Day came round. And the nephew called in to visit one of his aunts. Well, he said with great anticipation, how did things go yesterday with your sister? Huh, his aunt replied. I sat beside my phone all Christmas Day. And you know, my sister never phoned me once. The problem was both of them had waited on the other one to make the first move. For reconciliation and forgiveness to be achieved, both parties have to move. Both parties have to give a little. Esau wanted to. He ran to his brother. Jacob was not prepared to. Which of those two brothers do you identify with? Esau? in the red corner, or Jacob in the blue. Amen. We'll remain seated now as we sing our next hymn, number 528, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
in our prayers for others today, there is an invited response when I say, empower us, O Lord, you're invited to respond in the ways of forgiveness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your Son reminds us that you alone are perfect. And we deceive ourselves if we seek perfection in this earthly sphere. And so we pray. We pray for our world in its beauty and in its ugliness. Where nations threaten other peoples, where the poor are exploited and the evildoers seem to go unpunished. Where the actions of the rich cause harm to Mother Earth and suffering to the disadvantaged. Empower us, O Lord, in the ways of forgiveness. We pray for our communities in their self-giving and their self-centeredness. Where children can emotionally blackmail parents and parents can cause angst to children by bickering. Where in-laws can cause misery for others in the family and lying and deceit is commonplace among siblings. Where relationships are complex, honesty is scarce and someone would sell granny for a drug hit. Empower us, O Lord, in the ways of forgiveness. We pray for our churches in their twin modes of holiness and humanity. Where there is conflict and mistrust between believers, where there is a tendency to disregard those of another tradition, denomination or faith. When we use difference to bolster our own sense of superiority. Empower us, O Lord, in the ways of forgiveness. Loving and gracious Saviour, we lay before you today our rivalries and our hearts. The arguments that took sides on things that didn't matter. The times when we forgot the faith we have in common. Redeem us, O Saviour, so that we may find new ways to grow with our sisters and brothers into the people of promise that you will us to be. Empower us, O Lord, in the ways of forgiveness. Amen. Our final hymn is about going on that journey with our brothers and sisters. Brother, sister, let me serve, let me be as Christ to you.
as brothers and sisters united, that you may shape together your common destiny in Christ, through faith, love and generosity, and the blessing of the one indivisible God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, be with each one of you, now and always. Thank you.